Today on Government Matters, data has been called the ammunition of the future. The Defense Department's Chief Information Officer on how he intends to modernize the department's IT and make data a game changer on the battlefield. And President Biden has called attacks on Ukrainian civilians genocide. A look at the process for identifying and bringing perpetrators to justice. Government Matters starts right now. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news trends and topics that matter to the business of government. I'm Mimi Gerges. The Defense Department's Chief Information Officer acts as the principal advisor to the Secretary of Defense for IT, information management, telecom, among others. John Sherman is the DOD's Chief Information Officer. He's also the Acting Chief Digital and AI Officer. John, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mimi. It's great to be here with you today. So there's a lot that's encompassed in your role as the, the department CIO, but I wanted to start with cybersecurity. One aspect of that is the transition to zero trust. Explain why the transition and where the department is in that process. Thank you, Mimi. As CIO with that hat on, cybersecurity is my absolute top priority, ensuring the protection of our networks, systems, and data. Zero trust is a principle that posits that the enemy is already on the network somewhere. It is a paradigm shift. Now, it's one that's been underway here throughout the federal government private sector for a little while now. It's embodied in executive orders dating back to last year. But we here at the Department of Defense want to be a leader in the federal space on this to really move out with our very large enterprise with this new principle. To that end, we stood up a new portfolio management office to bring together the best practices and to really set the standards and principles of how we're gonna move out on this and brought an expert in from NSA, Mr. Randy Resnick, to head this PFMO. Zero Trust is built, as I said, on principles that the enemy is already on your network. And the way we deal with that is constricting lateral movement throughout the network through what we call fine grain access. And also looking at things like not signature-based analysis, but behavioral-based analysis on, on who's on there and making sure we have identity credential and access management or ICAM and an entire suite of capabilities that, that comes at it much differently than we've been doing. And with our 4 million person enterprise between service members, civilians, and contractors, it's a big enterprise we have to get after this with, but I see it as critical in the 21st century cyber threats we're protecting against. And the department is also moving towards enterprise cloud and in general modernizing IT. How is that going? It's going well. We have made a lot of progress on cloud over the past number of years within the military services. Of course, our flagship effort right now is with the Joint Warfighting Cloud Capability, or JWCC, for which the procurement is underway right now. And this is gonna bring us enterprise cloud capability at all three security classification levels, unclassified, secret, and top secret, from the continental United States all the way out to the tactical edge. And this is a capability we don't have right now, and it's gonna be critical for things like joint all domain command and control and the AI and data accelerator initiative, among others. You know, John, why is the DOD so behind the commercial sector in IT modernization? It's not like the department isn't high tech enough. I would argue we're not behind, there's pockets of real motivation and implementation we're getting after on areas like DevSecOps and indeed with cloud throughout the services on areas like we're doing with Spectrum and transport. So as you look across the services, the combatant commands and the, as we call the fourth estate, the defense agencies and field activities, we are modernizing. But Mimi, we can always do better. As we look at areas like user experience, and I know that's been in the news quite a bit lately with the quote unquote fix our computers mantra that's been out there on social media and elsewhere. There are things we need to do better at the user end of this. So that airman at Tinker Air Force Base, when she logs on, she doesn't see the little circle spinning and so on. It's a hardware solution. It might be transport on the base or long haul transport. It might be what we're doing in terms of cybersecurity scans, doing that smarter. But I'll tell you, as an operational user myself for many years, this resonates with me as a CIO, and I want to make sure that airman, marine, soldier, sailor, guardian, or civilian, wherever they're at, is going to have the very best user experience. And this is what gets me out of bed every morning. Well, looking at the mission side, what is your office's role in enabling JADC2, uh, 5G network capabilities, that kind of thing? So JADC2 
relies on many key capabilities, but we and CIO are providing many of them, and you named a lot of them. JWCC for that enterprise cloud capability, cybersecurity based on zero trust, what we're doing in terms of transport, both terrestrial and ensuring SATCOM, working with Space Force, for example. All those pieces coming together. And with my other hat on as the acting CDAO, it really is about the data as well. Any data, anywhere, anytime, to be able to stay inside the decision circle of our pacing challenge of China or anybody else to really make sure we can have military effects where we need them. So CIO plays a key role with JADC2. Well, each of the military services has a CIO. So how do you interact with them? How do you coordinate so that you're all moving in the same direction and you're not duplicating effort? That's a great question. As a team of teams, this is something I learned on the intelligence community side. As an enterprise CIO, you're only as successful as how you can bring your colleagues along, in this case with the services. Capitalizing on their ideas, on their concepts as a team, but also setting enterprise goals, strategies, standards to make sure, and I say this a lot about the rising tide rising, raising all boats here, but I really see that interaction I have with the military department CIOs, the Joint Staff J6, the defense agencies and field activities as critical. If I'm not, if they're not successful, I'm not successful. And that's how I proceed with my job as CIO. Well, let's talk about the FY23 budget request. What's your role in that and how much of a say do you get in setting priorities? With the FY23 or any budget, <clears throat> excuse me, I set the uh, early in the cycle, I set the priorities for the IT and cybersecurity ecosystem through guidance I promulgate. And then I have what's called budget certification on the back end before the budget is fully prepared. And that's where I have a lot of conversations with the military department CIOs, with the folks I have within a DOD CIO to make sure we are getting after the priorities on a lot of areas we just talked about with cybersecurity, C3, enterprise cloud, et cetera, SAP IT, special access program IT, to make sure we are setting the goals we need to get after and then holding the enterprise accountable. To, to do what we need to do. And so that's my role statutorily as the CIO. But again, it takes a team of teams. We just don't throw something over the transom and expect the mill devs to catch it. This is what we do for our governance and a lot of rigorous communication and dialogue. You know, we're over two years now from the start of the pandemic. I wonder what have been the most critical changes you made in facilitating that transition to remote work? It dates back to our collaboration capabilities initially with commercial virtual remote or CVR, which was a capability based on Microsoft Teams and that uh, Office 365 suite, but it was at impact level two or IL2 as we call it. And since last year, we moved to what we call DOD 365 at the impact level five level because of the cybersecurity environment that we live in. So this is working all across the enterprise, enabling remote work. Now we've had to, we had the bring your own approved device previously. Now we're setting some new standards. We have a number of pilots underway, again, because of cybersecurity. But in terms of what we had to do with the fundamentals, not only with the 365 capabilities, but areas like transport, cybersecurity, as I partnered closely with Paul Nakasone with this Cybercom hat on to make sure we're upholding the cyber standards and listening to the mill depths who are making the military departments and giving us insight as to what their users need. That's how we've changed the paradigm. All right, John, quick pause here and we'll come back and continue. Thank you. Coming next, we'll continue our conversation with the Defense Department's CIO and Acting Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Officer. Stay with us. Welcome back. My guest is John Sherman. He's the CIO for the Defense Department and Acting Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Officer. John, shifting now to your other hat, which is the acting uh, chief digital and artificial intelligence officer role. Um, this is a new office just established recently. Why was it created and what will it do? First and foremost, Mimi, it was created to provide decision advantage to the secretary of defense, the deputy secretary, our combatant commanders, and all the way to our battlefield leaders. Using our data, which we have a lot of, using advanced analytics, and using rapid insertion of digital capabilities 
and also to break down any institutional barriers we may have had previously among those functions to be able to get the very best outcomes and, and data-driven, data-led decisions, whether it's on boardroom issues or battlefield issues, to really unlock that, and especially given the environment we're living in with a very sophisticated pacing challenge in China and other particular or potential challengers in that space. Well, let's talk about practical applications then. I mean, how is the Defense Department using data to support European command in the current war in Ukraine? Probably the most obvious one would be the AI and Data Accelerator Initiative, ADA, as Deputy Secretary Hicks has talked about and other leaders in the department. We have an ADA team supporting U.S. European Command as we look at things like logistics flow and other military requirements there, working with the Chief Data Officer there in Stuttgart and working with other command requirements and allies to make sure that we're getting General Todd Walters and his entire team everything they need to be able to support U.S. and NATO priorities in this current crisis. And it's not only Ford in, in UCOM, it's back here in the Pentagon, for example, supporting the joint staff on areas like logistics requirement, force flows, looking at refugee activities, Ford in Poland and elsewhere, and bringing data-driven insights to what had been previously perhaps very manual processes and also not only supporting UCOM, but Transportation Command in Illinois and elsewhere as they're working to get our forces into Eastern and Central Europe and also those other issues that we need to do to respond to this crisis. You know, what's the hardest part, John, of making data the game changer on the battlefield? It has the potential of being. It really is unlocking the power of the data. It is a lot of pick and shovel work of working with all the components all across this vast DOD enterprise to make sure that data is not being kept in a place that it can't be accessed, not by anything malicious, but by folks just not knowing how to tag it, how to catalog it, raising it up into ecosystems like the Advana platform that is going to be that is part of CDAO to make sure that it has visibility and then the rigor from the very most senior leaders down to folks on the ops floor and elsewhere learning what it means to be a data-led organization everybody has skin in the game on this and it requires training it requires investment from the very top and this is where Deputy Secretary Hicks has been a critical leader where we have uh, corporate sessions known as DMAGs where we have data that's presented by component leaders like myself on what we're doing, for example, on IT and other modernization, or it could be personnel and readiness or acquisition to really put senior leaders on the spot with that, which then cascades all throughout the enterprise. It takes a lot of work. And this is where previously we had the CDO organization that is now part of CDAO that did a lot of that hard work to unlock the data. You know, it's, it's hard enough to make data interoperable and accessible across the services. What about international allies and partners? That's critical. As we work with Five Eyes, with NATO, and other partners all across the ecosystem to make sure that we have a lot of dialogue about what data standards mean. We have governance fora, just like I have with my CIO hat on, CDO, and now CDO, CDAO will have as we talk to partners. As a matter of fact, I'm talking to my Canadian colleague this afternoon. We're gonna talk about IT and data and other things like that. It requires leaning in to make sure we're working with those key allies and working through issues and actual use cases of where data is gonna be needed for combat operations, for logistics, non-combat issues, et cetera. We all have to lean in on it. All right, well, John, nice to talk to you. Thank you so much for making the time for us and, and being on the program. Thank you, Mimi. It's been a pleasure to be here today. Coming next, bringing war criminals to justice. Straight ahead on Government Matters, a look at the international organizations investigating atrocities in Ukraine and the role of the U.S. government. We'll be right back. With the news of atrocities against civilians in Ukraine piling up, the International Criminal Court and other organizations are gathering evidence to bring perpetrators to justice. Marty Flax is the director of the Human Rights Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Marty, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. 
Give us an idea of the process for identifying and bringing perpetrators of war crimes to justice. So there's at least three things that the prosecutor is going to need in order to bring successful uh, accountability to this atrocious situation in Ukraine. The first is evidence of serious international crimes, uh, the types of crimes that can be prosecuted at international tribunals, particularly in this case, egregious war crimes. And we're certainly seeing no lack of evidence of that um, between the um, the video and audio recordings, the drone footage, the satellite images that we're seeing coming out of this conflict, both recorded by civilians as well as investigators, journalists, and, and government officials. We're seeing widespread evidence of what certainly appears to be a campaign of war crimes, both in the air campaign and on the ground by Russian forces. Um, the second thing that's always needed in our international system is a venue with jurisdiction to try these crimes. Uh, fortunately, in this case, we have a number of options of different uh, locations where these crimes can be prosecuted. First and foremost, inside Ukraine, where the atrocities are being committed. The Ukrainian government is certainly uh, willing and uh, hope, hope to be able to prosecute these crimes themselves, assuming their justice system and their government is, is functioning in the future and able to do so. There's also a number of countries that have opened their own individual investigations of these atrocities under the principle of universal jurisdiction. So countries like Germany, Spain, Sweden, and others have opened investigations with the possibility of themselves trying these perpetrators as well. And then as you referenced, there is the International Criminal Court, which does have jurisdiction in this case because Ukraine has granted it that opportunity after the Russian invasion of Crimea in 2014. And so the ICC has begun its own investigation of these crimes. But the third leg of that stool uh, that's really important to achieve international justice is identifying defendants. And that's where I think it's gonna take some time and a significant amount of international effort to be able to try individuals, both to identify the specific people who are responsible for these crimes at the ground level, but also at a command and policy level, and then actually securing them as defendants to stand trial. Well, as you say, it takes time. I mean, this could take years for um, you know a perpetrator of an atrocity to actually stand trial. Absolutely, it does take a long time. So just last week we saw the first trial commenced at the International Criminal Court for a defendant accused uh, of crimes in the context of the genocide in Darfur, which began almost 20 years ago. Um, so this type of effort does involve patience. It does involve persistence. Um, we're gonna have to wait for an opportunity uh, either for someone accused of a crime to travel to a place where uh, the government is willing to arrest them and turn them over to, to an international court or for a change in, in government or situation in Russia where they have an incentive to actually cooperate um, with, a, with an accountability process. So that will take time, um, but I think if we're patient and we continue to persist in collecting and preserving that evidence, we will see that opportunity down the line. So what role does the U.S. government play, if any, in bringing war criminals to justice? The U.S. has an incredibly important role. Um, you know, we've had a uh, a very fraught relationship with the International Criminal Court over the years. Um, we have not supported the institution. We have not become a member of the ICC, but we have supported individual cases that the ICC is investigating, most famously the case of Darfur, where we allowed the Security Council to refer that case um, to the International Criminal Court because of the seriousness of the crimes that were being committed there. Um, the U.S. has a lot of resources, a lot of expertise that it can lend to the efforts of the prosecutor who needs things like uh, Russian and Ukrainian language speakers and financial resources to conduct what is going to be a massive uh, and difficult investigation. Um, but most importantly, the U.S. and its allies have information that could prove invaluable to the prosecutor to make his case for war crimes. And that's because the, the prosecutor's gonna need to identify not just the individual perpetrators on the ground, but who's responsible for giving those orders or creating those policies at the top. And the US and others have uh, an incredible amount of information about how the US, the Russian military is structured, how policy decisions are made. And to the extent they're able to share this, 
intelligence about specific acts that have been carried out by the Russians during this war, and that to the extent that they can declassify and share that information, it could really make a difference to prosecutors. You know, Marnie, it's, it's the age of everyone having a camera and a video recorder in their pocket. There's social media. What's different now about this war as compared to previous conflicts? Absolutely. So what's incredible about this conflict is the volume of information uh, and really evidence that we're seeing about the crimes being committed. So everyone who is documenting with their cell phones uh, and videos, the, the things that they're observing on the ground, um, as well as, you know, the, the drone footage and the commercial satellite imagery that we now have that can really pinpoint the locations of attacks, the context in which those attacks are happening, the fact that, you know, when the Mariupol Drama Theater was hit, for example, um, you know, no other surrounding buildings appear to have been targeted, so it certainly looks like that was the target uh, rather than an accident. Those, that kind of evidence and information uh, is really important to prosecutors because what they need to show for a lot of these war crimes is, is intent, um, and know, that really helps define that scope. And finally, Marty, is there any coordination going on among these different groups so that the victims don't have to give their testimonies several times? It's a really important question because when you have so many people looking into this, you do need to be incredibly sensitive to the stories that these people have to tell over and the trauma that they've experienced. So certainly there is some informal coordination efforts happening on the ground, um, but I think we need to be very cognizant as as tribunals and prosecutors start to bring specific charges that we focus our attention on those those opportunities to bring people to justice and, and, and focus our support on those opportunities. All right, well, Marty, thank you so much for joining us. Nice to talk to you. Thanks for having me. If you miss an episode of Government Matters, it's on our website, govmatters.tv. And tell us what you thought about today's program. You can reach us on Twitter at GovMattersTV. Follow us to get the latest updates, reminders, and links to our latest interviews. That's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 10.30 on WJLA 24-7 News and Sunday mornings at 10.30 on 7 News to stay plugged in on issues that matter to the business of government. Thanks for watching. I'm Mimi Gerges.